The Adventures of Henry R. Schoolcraft from his journal of 1818-1819, compiled by myself, Dennis M. Morrison, Sr. Um, I actually owned a copy of his uh, Mr. Schoolcraft's 1818-1819 journal. It was a treasured possession, which unfortunately was uh, lost during a, an ugly divorce years ago. But um, I compiled a booklet of um, some of the interesting passages from his journal, and uh, I want to share this first one with you, which is called um, On the Frontier. Henry Schoolcraft and Mr. Pettibone arrived at a small settlement on December 13, 1818. His description of frontier life is a study in early Americana. I quote from his journal, We are now at the last frontier settlement on the river, which is also the remote bond bound to which the white hunter has penetrated in the southwest direction from the Mississippi River toward the Rocky Mountain. Our first care on reaching this spot was to secure one of the hunters to be a guide. They are strongly impressed with fear of the Osage Indians." End quote. Schoolcraft explained that those in the settlement had been there but a short time. They had not completed their houses nor cleared any fields about them. Being that it was very um, late in December and these tasks needed to be completed, and also due to fear of the local Indians, they were not readily finding a guide. Mr. Schoolcraft found that even on this remote frontier, that the true obstacle to securing the needed guide was money. It was not long before a deal was struck with a Mr. Holt. The journal entry for December 14th records, He is to have our horse and ten dollars to accompany us as guide and hunter. He would, have, uh, he would have the benefit of all the skins and furs that he may collect on our tour. Mr. Holt is uh, to first go 100 miles downriver to purchase some corn um, for his family's use in his absence. In the meantime, we shall employ ourselves in making a canoe to descend the river on our return, or in completing the hunter's cabin, so that his family may be left in comfortable situation during our absence." End quote. In Schoolcraft's entry for December 17th, he describes a typical day for himself in that little settlement. Here he said, our day's work in the hunter's absence will be made up chiefly of the following particulars. In the morning, rise at at or before daybreak and build a large cabin fire of logs eight feet long then pound corn which is to serve the family during the day this was done in a wooden mortar with a pestle attached to a spring pole <clears throat> this the time from this until breakfast is employed in mending moccasins we then sally out into the forest with our axes and chop and clear away cane and brush until dinner which answers also for supper and happens about four o'clock so that we never sit down without an appetite. Our bill of fare presents no variety. We have hominy, that is corn boiled until it is soft, and bear's bacon for dinner. We have the same for breakfast, with the addition of sassafras tea. <clears throat> Work for the day closes with um, building a large night fire and packing up from the adjoining forest enough wood to replenish it during the night. When we lie down on bearskin before the fire and enjoy sweet repose, resulting from the daily labor. The weather has been very cold. Water poured upon the corn this morning previous to pounding, froze and carrying it from the cabin to the mortar a distance of about 30 feet. Today is quite difficult, um, end quote, excuse me. Today it's difficult to imagine living very far from a doctor or hospital, but we have to set our frame of mind right for the era that, era that we are dealing with. These people were truly isolated. Schoolcraft remarked of this, Again, I quote from him, Some days ago, a young child of Mrs. H., being taken violently ill with what I consider a bilious attack, I administered one of Lee's pills, which gave effectual relief, and the child suddenly recovered. The incident served to give them great confidence in my skill and led to further applications. And again, in quote, Wherever man establishes himself, a system of administering the laws on which he has imposed upon himself needs to be devised. Such also was the case in this name, nameless frontier settlement. Schoolcraft tells, justice which, is uncivilized, which in uncivilized society is administered through all the formalities of the law is here obtained in more summary manner. Two hunters having a dispute respecting a horse, which one had been instrumental in stealing from the other, the person, the person so aggrieved meeting the other some days later in the woods shot him through the body. He immediately fled, keeping 
in the woods for several weeks when the neighboring hunters, aroused by so glaring an outrage, assembled and set out in quest of him. Being an expert woodsman, he eluded them for some time, but at last they got a glimpse of him as he passed through a thicket and one of the party fired upon him. The ball passed through his shoulder but did not kill him. This event happened several days before our arrival, but I know not how it was terminated. In all probability, several lives will be lost before pacification takes place, as both parties have their friends and all are hot for revenge. As to Christmas Day of 1818 in this frontier vista, Schoolcraft has uh, but one brief entry. I was employed in splitting oak boards. At our suggestion, the hunters went out to kill some turkeys as we wished for a Christmas dinner, and after an absence of a couple hours, the hunter, hunters returned with 14. I prevailed on Mrs. H. to undertake a turkey pie with Indian cr meal crust, which we partook of under a shady tree on the banks of the river, the weather being warmer and pleasant. <clears throat> Schoolcraft gave uh, a negative um, image of frontier life as he related. The Sabbath is not known by any cessation of usual avocations of the hunter in this region. To him, all days are equally unhallowed, and the first and the last day of the week find him alike sunk in unconcerned sloth and stupid ignorance. Mr. Schoolcraft paints, as I said, a rather negative image of these particular frontier people, but then having visited several villages and having been taken advantage of monetarily, he can hardly be blamed. His accounts, though, are not painted with bitterness over this, but are considered as quite accurate. Again speaking of these white hunters, Schoolcraft continued, he neither thinks of himself nor reads the thoughts of others as if he ever acknowledges his dependence on the Supreme Being. It must be in silent awe produced by the furious tempest when the earth trembles with concussive thunders and lightning shatters the oaks around his cottage, that cottage which certainly never echoed the voice of human prayer. In conversation a few days ago with our host on the subject of religion, he observed that when living on the banks of the Mississippi some years ago, he occasionally <clears throat> a Methodist he would atta occasionally attend a Methodist meeting and thought it very good, a good, very good thing, but he found as many rogues there as anywhere else, and on account of a particular act of dishonesty in one of the members of the church, he had det determined never to go again, and had since thought there was no great use <coughs> in religion. To a man as educated as Mr. Schoolcraft was, the state of education in which he found this frontier village must have been appalling to his mind. In his narrative, we are given some insight to this. Schools are also unknown, and no species of learning is cultivated. Children are wholly ignorant of the knowledge of books and have not learned the rudiments of their own tongue. Thus situates, without moral restraint, brought up in uncontrolled indulgence of every passion, and without regard for religion, the state of society among the rising generation in this region is truly deplorable. In their childish disputes, boys frequently stab each other with knives, two instances of which have occurred since our residence here. No correction was administered in either case, the act rather being looked upon as a promising character trait. The children begin to assert their independence as soon as they can, uh, can walk, and by the time they reach the age of 14 have completely learned the use of the rifle, the art of trapping beaver and otter, killing bear, um, deer and buffalo, and dressing skins, and making moccasins and leather clothes. As in backwards nations today, the morality rate among infants was quite high. Schoolcraft explained, the women are observed to have few children, and of those being deprived of medical aid, an unusual number die in infancy. This problem, owing wholly to ad adventurous causes, and may be explained on the same principles as a similar circumstance in savage life the female being frequently exposed to the inclemency of many instances of man's work, living in camps on the wet ground without shoes, etc. Mrs. H. told me she has not lived in a cabin with a floor for several years, and that during that time they had changed their abode several times, and that she had lost four children all before they had reached their second year. And where it was mentioned earlier that there was no regard here for religion, there was a great belief in superstition, or the occult, if you will. Ignorance, it is said, always breeds superstition, which is for the occult. Schoolcraft said, among all classes, superstition is prevalent. Witchcraft, in a brief 
and a belief in the sovereign virtue of certain metals, so prevalent in those periods of history of the progress of the human mind, which reflect disgrace upon our species, still have their advocates here. Mr. F. related to us an amusing story of a rifle he had that was bewitched, so he could kill nothing with it, and sold it on that account. He had fixed his suspicion on a neighbor, and was full in belief that he had, out of malice, laid a spell upon his rifle. Now the next account shows what an inventive man Henry Schoolcraft clearly was. As he said, or wrote, Mrs. H. had a brass ring that she had worn for several years, and declared it to be an infallible remedy for the cramp, which she was much troubled with before putting on the ring, but had not had the slightest um, return of it since. She was now in much distress on account of having it having lately broken it so that it could not be worn, and observing that I collected ores and minerals, thought I might possess some skill in working metals, and solicited me to mend it. Mrs. H., however, would not listen to the fact that he had no blowpipe or other materials needed for such work. She was convinced that he could do it, and was relentless in desiring this. Not wanting to be disobliging, the schoolcraft wrote, I decided to make an attempt by cutting several small stems of cane of different thickness and fitting one into the other until the aperture was drawn down to the required degree of fineness. I soon made a blowpipe, a hollow cut in a billet of wood, and filled it with live hickory coals, answered instead of a lamp and with a small bit of silver and a little borax applied to the ring and submitted to the influence of my wooden blowpipe, I soon soldered the ring. 